Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's been a while since I've been in this position of uh, sharing the Grand Rounds. Welcome, everybody. We're getting close to the uh, end of Grand Rounds for the academic year. Um, before we start, um, a few announcements. Please complete the surveys. It's very important to keep our CME, as you all know. Um, this conference, as all of our, our Grand Rounds are, is being video uh, taped and it's live out and then it will be in our YouTube server. So please use mics when you want to make comments or ask questions. And uh, last but not least, um, don't forget our upcoming Southwest Valve Summit in October for those of you who uh, are in the valve business. It's our fourth or fifth year and it's a very successful uh, conference. Uh, today is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Antonio Gotto as our Grand Round speaker. Uh, Dr. Gordon needs no introduction. Uh, the field of uh, atherosclerosis and relation of lipids with atherosclerosis would not be where it is today without Dr. Gordon's uh, contribution, innumerable contributions, but perhaps one of the most important ones is that he, ch he ran the, clinic the clinical trial that definitely proved that controlling cholesterol uh, reduced cardiovascular events. I remember when I was still mm -hmm. an intern resident, there were super cardiologists, academic cardiologists in the country still arguing as to whether cholesterol had anything to do with heart disease. So uh, that was, in essence, the most pivotal trial ever in terms of getting the whole ball rolling. Uh, Dr. Goto has an incredible CV, which we're not going to spend time reading here, but he was um, um, a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford in his early years. He did training at Mass General, then he spent time at the NIH. Then he was recruited here at Baylor in the early days, I think 68 or 69, somewhere in there. He ran our um, research programs here and uh, did a lot of that pivotal work here at uh, Methodist Hospital and also Baylor when we were together. And in 1977, he became the chairman of medicine at Baylor and chief of, of medicine here at, uh, at Method. It's very important for me because in 77, I was coming out of the military uh, after doing my two years of payback service. And uh, Tony was the one who recruited me to come back here. So he was my boss for 20 years because he was chairman of medicine here for 20 years. And then in 97, he went to Cornell to be the dean of Cornell and the provost for medical affairs. Today, he is, is the dean emeritus of the school. And his uh, tenure there was amazing in terms of leadership, developments, fundraising, buildings being made. And uh, I think if they don't have a statue of Dr. Goto at Cornell yet, probably one will be coming <laughs> because they really love him over there too. Um, so in 2005, uh, we had the split between Baylor and Methodist, and we joined um, Cornell, and that affiliation was made possible because of Dr. Goto's presence in Cornell. So uh, then he became my boss again because then he was the dean of Cornell. So uh, our relation sp spans for, for many years. Today, Dr. Goto um, travels a lot between Houston and New York. Uh, he sits in the board of the, our research institute and we are also delighted that he sits in the board of our uh, journal, the um, Mesut Dibeki Cardiovascular Journal. So without any more introduction, because I will stay here for a whole hour, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Antonio Gotto to talk to us about hyperlipidemia, past, present, and future. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, uh, Mike, for that warm introduction. It's a pleasure to be back. and. Um, I am very, very pleased uh, about the affiliation between Walla Cornell and Methodist Hospital, which was signed um, within about uh, two months uh, of our uh, the initial discussion with Mr. John Bookout and Ron Gerardo, myself, and Sandy Wild, who's the, the chairman of the board of Walla Cornell. And um, uh, we announced a 30-year affiliation in 2004. So today I'm going to talk about hyperlipidemia, past, present, and future. I'm going to say a bit about the history of hyperlipidemia here at Methodist Hospital and Baylor, the Texas Medical Center. Uh, these are my disclosures. 
I'm going to start with the structure and metabolism of lipoproteins. For those of you who are not uh, in this field, uh, just a touch about it. Historically, Felix Marchand proposed the term atherosclerosis, suggesting that it's uh, responsible for all, almost all obstructive processes in the arteries. We know that this is a process that begins in the enema of the artery and ultimately can lead to clinical events, myocardial infarctions, cerebrovascular accidents, uh, aneurysms, and peripheral arterial disease. The relationship with cholesterol uh, and blood vessel disease really started uh, with Aneshkov, who was a Russian scientist, and he was doing this work initially at Freiburg uh, with a German cardiologist, and they fed cholesterol to rabbits and showed that it produced vascular lesions. Well, if you pour fat into water, it will float to the top. And so there has to be a way for the lipids, the cholesterol, the cholesterol ester, triglyceride, phospholipids, to get transported in the blood in a soluble and stable form. Uh, and those, th that structure is called a lipoprotein. Uh, and this wasn't known until 1929 when Mashburf, who was a Russian, uh, rather French investigator, published uh, his thesis about the relationship between the lipids and the fat in the blood. So this was the first description of a lipoprotein. He was using horse serum and uh, you separating the, the lipid protein fraction from the rest of the components of the blood with an ammonium sulfate uh, fractionation procedure, uh, which is used uh, often to separate proteins. <clears throat> and probably what he was looking at is what we would call HDL, high-density lipoprotein. The structure of a lipoprotein is such that the, the lipid, the most water-insoluble hydrophobic components, the cholesterol esters and triglycerides, are in the center of the particle. It's a spherical particle. It's made soluble by a combination of apoprotein and phospholipid that forms a surface layer. And then the cholesterol, the free cholesterol, uh, is divided uh, between the core, the center of the particle, and the surface component. And we can divide the lipoproteins into those that contain apoB. Uh, this is the most atherogenic of the lipoproteins. ApoB100, which is made in the intestine, ApoB48 in the liver, or, or, uh, just the opposite, B48 uh, in the intestine, B100 in the liver. And <clears throat> all of those other than HDL are considered to be atherogenic. The non-HDL lipoproteins, LDL, intermediate density, very low density, remnants of the very low density, chylomicron remnants, uh, and lipoprotein little a. And then those that are anti-atherogenic are the ones that contain the ApoA1 uh, and other ApoA proteins, but the primary protein is ApoA1. And they are, make up the high-density lipoprotein, one that's called alpha HDL. Before uh, the term HDL was used, these lipoproteins were called alpha. The alpha lipoproteins are beta um, and the pre-beta. And they, that corresponded to their migration on electrophoresis. So when they were studied in the, electro, uh, uh, in the ultracentrifuge, the alpha lipoproteins, which migrated with the alpha globulins, corresponded to the HDL, the beta lipoproteins, which migrated with the beta globulins, became the low-density lipoproteins, and the pre-beta lipoproteins, which migrated just in front of the beta lipoproteins on electrophoresis, were the very low-density lipoproteins. So the, the high-density lipoproteins and what's called the pre-beta HDL, which is an earlier form 
of the HDL that doesn't have all of its lipid components, these are antiatherogenic. So there are two general classes of lipoproteins. A Dr. Goffman introduced ultracentrifuge for separating these particles based on their density. The more fat they contain, the larger the particle and the faster they'll float in a salt gradient. And the more dense they are, the higher the protein content, uh, the less rapid uh, they, they will float. And so the most dense of all are the smallest particles and the most protein rich, about 50-50 protein and lipid. Uh, and these are the high density lipoproteins. All of these other lipoproteins contain ApoB. The chylomicron remnants contain ApoB48, which is made in the intestine. Uh, there's a stop codon so that only uh, intestine only makes about half the size of the apoprotein that's made in the liver. And all of these others uh, contain ApoB100 in all of these particles other than the HDL or atherogenic. With a Dr. William Friedewall at the NIH that worked out an equation for calculating the concentration of the LDL cholesterol without having to go to the ultracentrifuge to do it. Now today they are direct me methods for measuring LDL, uh, but this is still the one that is most commonly used. And so one takes the total cholesterol, that's all of the HDL and non-HDL, and subtracts from it the HDL, but then you have to get the triglyceride content in the VLDL, and to get that, you divide the triglycerides by five. This assumes a ratio of triglyceride to cholesterol of five to one in the VLDL, and that gives the LDL cholesterol. Now this calculation, this formula, doesn't hold if the triglycerides are greater than 300. Now a little bit about uh, atherosclerosis and lipoprotein research at Houston Methodist and Baylor College of Medicine. Um, I moved here uh, with a, a group of investigators from NIH and some internally like, like Lewis Smith 47 years ago and we established the section on atherosclerosis and lipoprotein research in the Methodist Hospital in Baylor. Uh, we had a clinical laboratory uh, in the Methodist Hospital. Dr. DeBakey was supportive, but he's very skeptical about cholesterol. He said, you can measure cholesterol if you want to in all my patients. I measure through your lipoprotein analysis, but I can tell you it has very little to do with my patients. And I said, why is that? And he said, they all have normal cholesterol. And I said, what do you consider normal? And he said, well, anything under 300 is normal. <laughs> so we established this section uh, in 1971. And <clears throat> I was recruited in 1970 and came down and spent uh, December and a good part of the winter, winter writing grants. And so we were fortunate in that we were, when I arrived, we awarded a specialized center in arteriosclerosis, uh, one of six of the original centers uh, from the NIH, and a contract to establish a lipid research clinic which studied uh, the prevalence of hyperlipidemia in the community, particularly in the school district, in the Harris County School District, and also began the coronary primary prevention trial. Uh, we knew at this, by this time that an elevated cholesterol was associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, but there had never been a trial to show that if you had a high cholesterol and you lured it with a drug, or for that matter with a diet or anything else, that you could reverse the process or decrease the risk of the process. We undertook the sequencing of the two major proteins, ApoA1 from HDL uh, and ApoB100 uh, and ApoB48 from LDL and v VLD and chylomicrons. Uh, under the leadership of Dr. Richard Jackson, ApoA1 sequence was determined, and I'd started on ApoB in 1967 when I went to NIH, and uh, we didn't finish this, do the sequence of it until 1984, 
as Dr. Chow Yang and Dr. Larry Chen and, and others, uh, uh, Baylor and Methodist. Uh, and Dr. <coughs> Jim Sparrow and his colleagues synthesized APOC1, another one of the apoproteins in VLDL, uh, the first uh, apoprotein ever to be completely sequenced. Dr. Henry Hoff collaborated uh, from the Department of Pathology and showed that uh, APOB100 was retained in the arterial wall, and this retention is now believed to be one of the early steps in triggering off the atherosclerotic process. The coronary primary prevention trial was a very difficult trial to perform. We were one of 12 national centers. We screened over 30,000 uh, men to recruit 300 participants from this center. Overall, there were 3,806 middle-aged men they had to have LDLs over 170. We tried to get them to take cholestyramine, 24 grams a day. Uh, they took about half that amount, uh, and we were very fortunate uh, that we, when the trial was over, there was a 19% statistically significant reduction in cardiovascular events. I have to tell Dr. Uh, Pernonis uh, uh, that the cardiology, and all of the cardiologists uh, here, uh, that um, Dr. Zogby as well, that the cardiology community was very skeptical of these results. They said it's only positive with a one-sided T-tail test. Uh, we really shouldn't t put much weight <laughs> on this. And uh, if I hadn't been president of the American Heart Association at the time, the American Heart Association would never have supported the result of this. But as a result of this trial, Companies uh, such as Merck and, and others uh, were stimulated to develop other drugs to uh, reduce cholesterol and LDL, and this led directly to the launch of the National Cholesterol Education Program, which has now put out a series of directives. When the study was reported, uh, this was a cover of Time magazine. I have three, had three daughters. Uh, and they had heard me talk about cholesterol for years. They never paid any attention to it or thought that I knew what I was talking about until it made the cover of Time magazine. And then they thought, uh, well, I must know something. In 1974, the National Institutes of Health uh, put out a request for a new type of center. This was really the beginning of trend, uh, translational research. They wanted to move the the findings from the laboratory and the clinic out into the community. And so they announced that they would select three national centers, one in heart and blood vessel disease, one in uh, uh, just blood disease, and one in lung disease. And so we applied as a joint Baylor Methodist application. Dr. DeBakey was the director of it, and I was a scientific director, and so we were awarded the only one in heart and blood vessel disease. Now, this was Dr. Bob Levy, who was the director of the Heart Lung Institute at that time, Ted Cooper, who was Under Secretary of Health, Dr. DeBakey, myself, and Dr. Ringler, who was the deputy director of NIH. We had a number of dignitaries who visited the Texas Medical Center. Uh, this was the vice premier of China, Fang Li, uh, with uh, Ted Bowen and me, and Dr. Joel Marsitz explaining uh, the structure of the amphipathic helix uh, to the uh, vice premier. This structure uh, is the main basis for, by which the apoproteins and phospholipids interact. This is Dr. Butler, who was a subsequent president of Baylor. And this, I believe, is Gene Nelson, who worked in the cath lab. Uh, this is Dr. William Winters. Does anyone recognize this person? <laughs> so uh, the, Dr. Quinones and Dr. Winters were explaining uh, the echocardiogram. Well, as part of this demonstration center, we had to move out into the community. And we did a smoking, uh, smoking prevention project 
in the high schools and grammar schools with the University of Houston. We did a diet intervention in the community with the Texas A&M Agricultural Extension Service and we established a restaurant, set up a restaurant in the Methodist Hospital called Shea Eddy, dedicated to the principle that you could eat well and eat healthily at the same time. And this cookbook, the Shea Eddy cookbook, won the James Beard Foundation Award for the uh, Healthy Cookbook of the Year. When I went to, uh, to Cornell to become dean, I was elected dean in September of um, 1996, and Anita and I went up, and I was elected by the, the board uh, to be the dean and had several interviews. So the next morning she said, <clears throat> uh, well, why don't you go down and get a copy of the Times and see what the interviewer said. So I went down and brought up a copy of the Times and opened it up, and it said, Cornell elects noted cookbook author as dean. <laughs> So you have to be careful what follows you. <laughs> a group of uh, investigators carried out the LCAS study looking at uh, fluvist the statin fluvastatin uh, in patients with mild to moderate cholesterol elevation and showed that treatment uh, with uh, fluvastatin would decrease the rate of progression of coronary blockage using quantitative coronary angiography. Dr. Hurd organized this study. Dr. Ballantyne was involved. Dr. Farmer, Dr. Ferguson, who was at Texas Heart at the time, now at Amgen. Uh, Peter Jones, Stuart West, Lance Gould from UT, and myself. And a community study was started by NIH, and we were selected to be the central laboratory for this study called the ERIC study in four different communities, and uh, Dr. Christy Ballantyne has continued to head this laboratory, which uh, continues to be involved in the study. Now, let me just switch for a moment uh, to uh, lipoproteins. The very low-density lipoprotein is secreted from the liver, and after it's secreted, the triglyceride component is attacked by lipoprotein lipase, converted to a smaller lipoprotein, intermediate density, which is then converted to low density, which is then removed by the LDL receptor. So one wants to do uh, whatever you can to increase the activity of the LDL receptor. The LDL can deposit directly or after oxidation and chemical modification cholesterol into the arterial wall into the macrophage, uh, which develops into, with other macrophages, into the atherosclerotic plaque. The HDL is secreted initially, begins initially as free ApoA1, either from the liver or from the intestine. It then can pick up phospholipid uh, and cholesterol uh, from the peripheral tissue. And according to the currently accepted scheme, the cholesterol is converted uh, into cholesterol ester through the action of a protein called LCAT, which stands for less than cholesterol acyl transferase. And then the cholesterol ester is taken up to the, by the liver by a receptor called SRB1, which uh, recognizes and sucks into the liver cholesterol ester. And this process is call reverse cholesterol transport. And the cholesterol ester in the HDL can be transferred back and forth, exchange for triglyceride into the LDL, IDL, and VLDL fractions. This is called cholesterol ester transfer uh, protein. And there have been drugs that have been tested uh, to which inhibit this protein and thus raise the level of HDL. Well, atherosclerosis has continued uh, to this day. Uh, atherosclerosis and lipoprotein research and has enjoyed continued success, uh, including uh, Christy Ballantyne, Peter Jones, Henry Pownall's leadership, uh, and they put teams together that have continued uh, the work. And Dr. Pownall recently uh, presented in Toronto 
the International Atherosclerosis Symposium, uh, a new uh, theory about how the cholesterol gets in, back into the liver from the HDL. Uh, and he and uh, Biber, who was here with him this morning, have shown that the free cholesterol gets transferred into the liver and at a much greater rate than the cholesterol is converted into cholesterol ester. So there seems to be, a, uh, based on their research, a new, uh, different pathway in which cholesterol directly goes into the liver, either from this pre-beta HDL or nascent HDL, as well as from HDL, and that the primary way of getting cholesterol in the liver is through free cholesterol and not cholesterol ester, uh, as would be indicated by the current schemes. But what are the lipid-lowering therapies? Well, we start with diet and lifestyle, a diet with uh, rich in fruits, vegetables, whole grains, low-fat or non-fat dairy products, fish, legumes, poultry, lean meats. Limit foods high in saturated fat, trans fat, partially hydrogenated fat and cholesterol. Limit excess consumption of salt, added sugars and alcohol. Engage in aerobic exercise, stop smoking, and lose weight when that is needed. The cholesterol biosynthetic pathway is summarized here, starting with acetyl-CoA and acetoacetyl-CoA. The rate-limiting step is HMG-CoA reductase, and this is the step that's inhibited by statins. It is statins are competitive inhibitors of HMG-CoA reductase, so they block the conversion of HMG-CoA to mevalonic acid, ultimately then decrease cholesterol in the liver. The liver cells, hepatocytes, uh, detect that there's a decrease in cholesterol, and so they upregulate the LDL receptor, which then increases the clearance of LDL from the blood. Uh, mevalonate, uh, uh, HMG-CoA, mevalonate are uh, six carbon compounds, <clears throat> and in this process, the mevalonate uh, gets converted to a five carbon intermediate, an isopentanyl pyrophosphate, uh, and then you get three five carbon units coming together to form farnesyl pyrophosphate, so you have 15 carbons here. This is isoprenoid pathway, which is involved in uh, forming a number of uh, growth factors and other farnesylated proteins. And you put two 15 carbon units together, and you get squalene, which is a 30 carbon entity. And this has to form a cyclic structure. You get decarboxylation, and you wind up with cholesterol as an end product. Mike Brown and Joe Goldstein, uh, back in 1974, discovered the LDL receptor, uh, which is a way that hepatocytes take cholesterol into the liver. The LDL receptor uh, binds to the apoprotein. They, there are positively charged amino acid, acids, lysines, and arginines in the ApoB100, about halfway down uh, the protein. And these uh, bind to negatively charged amino glyco, uh, glycosoglycans in the LDL receptor. They get into the liver. It gets broken down to free cholesterol. And the LDL receptor gets recycled to the surface. However, there is a protein which was only discovered in uh, 2003 called PCSK9, which binds to the LDL receptor and keeps it from getting recycled to the surface. Instead, it targets it to the lysosomes where, it's, uh, where the receptors are degraded. So if you overproduce PCSK9, then you'll have a decrease in receptors and you'll have a similar condition to what occurs in familial hypercholesterolemia, where there's an inherited deficiency in these receptors. So a recent uh, new development in the treatment of hypercholesterolemia is 
been the development of the monoclonal antibody, which will bind to the PCSK9, reduce the level of PCSK9, and upregulate the LDL receptors. And toward the end of the talk, I'll describe two trials which have used this technique with the monoclonal antibody. Dr. Jonathan Cohen uh, and Helen Hobbs at Dallas stood, studied a group of individuals from the Dallas Heart Study looking for individuals who had either an overexpression of PCSK9 or an underexpression. And in those individuals who had an underexpression, a group of African Americans who had two, mut uh, two mutations had a 28% reduction in LDL, but an 89% reduction in coronary events. So this is much greater than you would have expected from the statin trials where you get about a two to one reduction in events. Uh, so a much greater reduction and similarly in a Caucasian population. These are the drugs that work through the LDL receptor. Whatever will suck cholesterol out of the body or decrease the amount of cholesterol in the liver will increase the activity of the LDL receptor. And the FDA is now very uh, thoroughly committed to supporting drugs that work through this mechanism. If it works by a different mechanism, then they're more skeptical and you will have more roadblocks to getting such drug approval. The bile acid sequestrants pull bile acids uh, out into the stool and decrease the, uh, the supply of cholesterol in the liver, which is, is required to form the bile acids. Zetamibe inhibits a receptor uh, in the intestine that absorbs cholesterol. Statins inhibit uh, HMG CoA reductase. And the PCSK9 inhibitors inhibit PCSK9, which in turn releases the uh, suppression of the LDL receptor. Uh, we did this study in Texas, the Air Force Texas Coronary Artery Project study. It was done at two sites, one in uh, San Antonio at the military base and a second at the uh, uh, osteopathic hospital in Fort Worth. These were individuals who at that time had what was considered to be an average level of LDL. It was 150 at the baseline. This was a primary prevention study. We used a drug, lovastatin, which was the first statin approved by the FDA in 1987. And there was a 37% risk reduction over the course of the trial. Now, th these were very healthy individuals. It was a Dr. Eli Whitney in San Antonio who had, who had weekly uh, sessions, PEP rally type sessions, and he had these participants out uh, exercising, following a very rigorous diet. <clears throat> and even though the, the baseline LDL was 150, in the placebo group, the event rate was much lower than in the subsequent Jupiter study where the baseline was 105. So whether you're on a statin or not on a statin, a diet and exercise program can make a great deal of difference. So you don't replace uh, lifestyle just by taking a statin. We, I did a post hoc study with Paul Ritka from Harvard, uh, and what we found was that if either the LDL or the C-reactive protein were above the median, or both above the median, the patients, participants, in AFCAPS, TexCAPS did better on lovastatin. If neither one was above the median, then the lovastatin didn't seem to help. Dr. Ritker has been interested in the role of inflammation and particularly a high sensitivity CRP as a marker for coronary artery disease for a number of years. In the Jupiter trial, the participants, uh, this is a primary prevention trial, the participants only had a baseline LDL average of 105, and they were treated uh, with uh, resuvastatin, 20 milligrams a day, but in order to get into the trial, they had to have a C-reactive protein over two. And this st study was stopped after approximately two years, stopped very early because of a 44% reduction in events. 
Well, a group uh, organized by the Oxford uh, uh, Epidemiology uh, Group carried out uh, its collaboration of investigators around the, around the globe a study, a meta-analysis of the benefit of LDL reduction. In this meta-regression analysis of 49 clinical trials with over 312,000 participants, for one millimolar reduction in LDL cholesterol with a statin, there was a 23% reduction in events. And this occurred in males, females, diabetics, non-diabetics. That uh, amounts to approximately 39 milligrams per deciliter. And so this is, can be applied wherever one is on the LDL curve. That is, if you're up at the high end of the curve and you get a 10% reduction of LDL, uh, that will correspond to, a, a, uh, the L, if the LDL is 300 to 30 milligrams or so uh, decrease. On the other hand, if you're down at the low end of the curve, you get less absolute change. You get the same percentage change with the statin, but less absolute change. For the non-statin interventions that act through upregulating the LDL receptor, it was a 25% reduction. So these figures have held pretty well. Uh, what is generally accepted now is a that uh, for a one millimole reduction in LDL cholesterol, or 39 milligrams per deciliter, you'll get approximately a 22% reduction in events. So you can look wherever you are on the LDL curve and do this calculation and make a prediction. Another meta-analysis published in Lancet looked at individuals at a lower risk of vascular disease, and these were individuals whose five-year risk of major events was less than 10%. And each of these, uh, in each of these also, uh, there was the same 22% or tw actually 25% in this study reduction. So whether you're in a high-risk category or low-risk category, uh, you get uh, the same, approximately the same benefit. In 2013, the <coughs> American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association put out a new set of guidelines, and these have led to quite a bit of controversy because they removed the targets. They said that they're no longer targets because there haven't been uh, randomized clinical trials that specifically address targets. And so we're just going to say you either get a 30% reduction if you need a moderate intensity statin or 50% reduction if you have a high intensity statin. But there are four categories they described uh, who definitely would benefit from statin treatment. Somebody with established cardiovascular disease, with someone with an LDL over 190, a diabetic between ages 40, 75 with an LDL of 70 to 189, someone aged 40 to 45, LDL 70 to 189, whose 10-year risk is over 7.5%. Now, it turns out that that's just about everybody who's over 75. So if you're in that category, you qualify. So what, what should you do? Well, what you need to do is first focus on lifestyle and statin uh, but in individuals over 75, you need to have a talk with them, uh, determine what their general state of health is, and have a shared decision-making approach with each individual patient. There's a new set of, uh, there were, of guidelines that are anticipated to be presented at the American Heart Association meeting in November. That will be ATP4. Uh, we hope that they take some of these new uh, data into account. But uh, if a patient falls into one of the four statin categories, you could refer them to a lipid specialist or a dietitian nutritionist, use azetamibe, bile acid sequestrants, PCS, K9 inhibitor. These two drugs, mifepristone and lametapide, they're only approved for 
homozygotes with familial hypercholesterolemia, an orphan indication, and mipomersin actually is taken off the market. LDL apheresis, which uh, uh, Peter Jones is using in a few patients here, can be used for patients with familial hypercholesterolemia who are either resistant uh, to other to drug treatment, and there are a number of people who are unable to tolerate statins. Now these are the new class of drugs, avalokumab, a monoclonal antibody, uh, and these results were published a year ago in the Fourier study. Here you see a 59% reduction in LDL cholesterol, and these were patients who were already on a maximum dose, a maximum tolerated statin therapy. And there was a 15% reduction in the primary endpoint of cardiovascular events. And then <clears throat> recently at the American College of Cardiology, a second uh, study was presented. Uh, this is with the drug Proluent. Uh, this was an Odyssey study, and there also was approximately the same reduction, a 15% reduction on top of statin therapy. In this study, there was actually a reduction in total mortality. So there's a mortality benefit. It's been difficult to obtain these drugs. The payers are reluctant to give approval, and it requires extensive documentation. So they've been considerably underused. But with these drugs on top of statin therapy, you can almost dial in what LDL you want. There were a significant number of individuals in this Odyssey study who whose LDLs got down under 15. Uh, and the investigators it stopped the drug at that point and gave them azetamibe. They might have had an even more positive outcome or result if they, it, they hadn't done this. But at any rate, we can get the LDL down almost as low as we want it. What we don't know, uh, we do know there, is, there are diminishing returns as you get lower and lower on the curve. Uh, but you can still see additional benefit. How low can you go without causing harm? Uh, and that's an unknown question. So far, the drugs have been remarkably safe, the PCSK9s, the, but uh, they've only been used for a relatively short period of time. After statins were introduced, it took 20 years to detect an increased incidence of diabetes with uh, high-intensity statins. Briefly, future treatments. There are trials underway using a different approach to PCSK9 inhibition using inhibitory RNA. And with this approach, one or two injections a year can give approximately the same result as the monoclonal antibodies, which require an injection every other week. Vimpadoric acid, uh, I'll say just a word or two about this in a moment. Antisense targeting of APOC3 apopoietin-3 and LPL little a, and anti-inflammatory therapies. I haven't had uh, <clears throat> time to go into a discussion of these different entities, but APOC3 inhibition reduces triglyceride. Uh, it increases lipoprotein lipase activity. Uh, and there, there is a, an antisense against APOC3 uh, which uh, has progressed to the point where there was an FDA advisory committee meeting last month that recommended approval by a vote of 12 to 8. There is about a 10% uh, incidence of significant thrombocytopenia uh, with this drug. Uh, it requires every uh, other week or uh, weekly or every other week dosing. Uh, they are mild injection site reactions. Uh, but uh, the FDA will announce uh, by the end of August whether they're going to accept the advisory committee's approval uh, or recommendation and approve this drug. Its approval will be for familial chylomicronemia syndrome, which is an ultra-orphan uh, drug category. But there's not any other therapy available for this uh, entity today, and it, it's a significant cause of fatal pancreatitis, recurrent pancreatitis. I won't go into apopoietin-3, but uh, it inhibits lipoprotein lipase. So if you block it, uh, you will increase lipoprotein lipase activity. 
LP little a is an independent predictor of cardiovascular risk. I just mentioned the bimpedoric acid because Dr. Christy Ballantyne is leading uh, this study uh, by the uh, drug group Asperion of this drug. It inhibits ATP citrate li lyase, and what this does is decrease the concentration of acetyl-CoA, which is two steps up from HMG-CoA reductase. So it inhibits the same pathway, same cholesterol synthesis pathway as do statins, just two steps above it. And this currently is undergoing a study, first of all, that Christie is leading to see uh, if it's safe and will give satisfactory LDL reduction. Uh, and then uh, there's a study that Steve Nissen is leading uh, looking at cardiovascular outcomes. Last year, uh, Paul Ritker presented the results of the Canto study using a monoclonal antibody against interleukin-1 beta. And this also resulted in a 15% reduction in events without any change, any change whatsoever in the lipids. And so this is another approach, anti-inflammatory approach. It also reduced cancer. I think Novartis is probably more excited about the cancer potential than the cardiovascular potential. There have been a number of studies looking at the some of the enzymes and, and factors that we've talked about, the azetamide, uh, the PCSK9, genetic studies in which LDL is lowered from birth. And whereas with the statin trial, you get about a 22% reduction in events over approximately a five-year period where the, when the study was carried out. But if you inherit a low LDL if you're fortunate enough to inherit one and you have a lifetime lower level, you get a 54% reduction for one millimole um, of LDL reduction rather, and, rather than a 22% reduction in events. So this makes a strong case, a strong plea for early intervention with lifestyle to get started earlier. The earlier you start, the more benefit you get. So uh, let me conclude by saying LDL remains a primary target of therapy and statins, at least for the for foreseeable future, will be the first line treatment after diet and exercise. Uh, efforts to further decrease LDL may help reduce residual risk, but as I've, I've shown you, you can almost dial in whatever LDL you want. Lifelong reduction of LDL and intensive treatment of other risk factors are central to the prevention of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So uh, let us keep in mind that even if we get LDL down to the lowest levels, we don't keep everybody from having a heart attack or, or stroke. There's still a residual risk. So there's still a lot of work to do, and I don't think we're going to be out of business soon. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Ronnie. It was wonderful to see how you link the past with the exciting future, and that was just beautifully done. Open for questions, Dr. Zogby. Ronnie, you well, know it very much. I read it as a historical perspective and a futuristic perspective, and I read it is amazing. It's great to have you. Um, we know the guidelines did not aim for a target, and I know maybe this will change down the line, but. How do, you, how do you marry many people actually using targets and aiming maybe conceivably an LDL below 70? And is there, is there you think, advantage knowing extrapolating from the PCSK9 inhibitors, uh, you know, redu significant reduction in LDL, maybe to push statins and others without going to the PCSK9 and knowing the hurdles that we have nowadays? to bring LDL cholesterol very low. Mm. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> Gene Brownwell gave a lecture at uh, this meeting in Toronto in which he said, this is how you get to live to be 100. But um, whether you call it a, a target, I think you have to be take into account the science and what the 
the science shows you that, that you can achieve further reduction by lower levels. And so it comes, turns out to be a trade-off. Is the, the cost of the drug, uh, is the inconvenience of taking injections, uh, is this worth another 10% reduction? Probably the older you get, the more valuable it seems to be. But uh, whether you call it a whether you call it a target or whether you call it a threshold, uh, probably they will. The committee may get around calling it targets by calling it a threshold. So I think that would address the point you were raising about uh, having 70, trying to get below 70 milligrams per deciliter. But these uh, these studies certainly show you can get additional benefit by further lowering the LDL. Yeah. Um, and I agree with Dr. Canonis, uh, the transition from the past, how this has developed to the current time and look in the future is very interesting. And uh, in that regard, uh, uh, with treatment, you had mentioned uh, LDL receptor, the four categories of drugs to interfere with that. But going forward, and, and with this recent study with Biova and Henry of the uptake of free cholesterol, do you see agents or ways to enhance that uptake coming as future treatments? The, the, uh, well, Dr. Pownell, give Dr. Pownell the, let Dr. Pownell answer that question. <laughs> 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 it, it is it. Yeah. All right. Um, yes, in the last few years, uh, we've been very interested in how free cholesterol, which was highly mo is highly mobile, might contribute to atherosclerosis. And there have been several large studies, one the Dallas Heart Study, one from uh, Dan Rader at the University of Pennsylvania, showing that uh, the efflux of free cholesterol from macrophages, a major cell type in atherosclerosis, is a metric for atheroprotection by high-density lipoproteins. And uh, part of the, one component of this is the quality of the high-density lipoproteins. We've asked the question then, and as part of our presentation in uh, Toronto, um, can some high-density lipoprotein be atherogenic and have too much free cholesterol, which transfers in five minutes and across its membranes in milliseconds. Can this contribute to it? So really, I'm glad you asked that question because uh, we would like to do a trial. And if there's a cardiologist who could help us out to look at a population with documented disease or no disease and determine their phospholipid to or free cholesterol to phospholipid ratio and to see if that's different. And then it would uh, explain the U-shaped curve in HDL cholesterol, where the sweet zone is between 50 and 80 milligrams per deciliter. At low levels, it has a ratio as high. At high levels, where we think it's free cholesterol, the hazard ratio is high. So thank you for that. OK, just a quick question. Uh, one, thank you. It's a spectacular talk and a, a nice historical perspective. I, I, the one question I would ask you, now that we have these newer therapies, which can really get the LDL cholesterol down to very low levels, is there any level at which you start to say, we're getting too low now? Well, that's the $64 million question. We know that in A beta lipoproteinemia, there are many different defects. They make absolutely no ApoB. And, and there are various fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies early in life. So we know you've got to have some. But how, uh, at birth, the, the um, blood concentration of LDL has been reported to be somewhere between 25 and 35 milligrams per deciliter. So um, I wouldn't want mine to get too much lower than what I started with at birth. <laughs> uh, I think Dr. Cook had a question. Tony, that was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the um, lipoproteins carry other things uh, besides cholesterol, as you know better than I do. And I was just wondering what, uh, if there's any uh, evidence that some of the benefit of uh, 
our cholesterol modulating agents may be due to uh, changes in those factors. For example, uh, HDL, which is deemed to be atheroprotective, can carry, carries antioxidant enzymes with it. Uh, all the lipoproteins contain various microRNAs that may also affect the vasculature. Um, those, of course, would be correlated with lipoprotein levels and would be correlated with cholesterol levels. So I wondered how much, how much of an impact uh, do these other factors, might these other ha factors have on the benefits that we're seeing with our cholesterol-lowering agents? Well, I think probably with the, with the agents that we have uh, that most of the benefit is coming from LDL, but there may also be some, well, there's an anti-inflammatory uh, benefit uh, reduction of CRP with statins. It's interesting the PCSK9 inhibitors do not affect inflammation at all. There's no change in HSCRP uh, with the PCSK9 inhibitors. HDL carries 90 or 100 different substances, and there have been some studies with HDL right after an acute coronary event uh, in which it's not as efficient in promoting cholesterol efflux from cells. So the view for H toward HDL is that it's more of a marker than it is protective directly, uh, but the, the level of HDL still is a very good marker and predictor of risk. Uh, if you get to very high levels, uh, it doesn't seem to be, may not be as protective as uh, Dr. Pownell mentioned, but it may be that the, uh, the functionality of the, of the HDL when, uh, in an inflammatory state uh, is changed so that it's not as protective. Along those lines, I wanted okay. to ask you, uh, you know, we have this beautiful slide that I've been shown from the paper that you mentioned with the meta-analysis where you have this direct line, yeah. lower LDL, lower LDL, less events, okay? So when you plug in now the results of the PCSK9 in that curve, does it follow the curve in terms of reduction so, or does it have a slightly different shift from that curve, just interestingly? Mm -hmm. So as you mm -hmm. lower further with PSK9, do the event rates reduction follow that line that was so beautifully shown a few years ago in the meta-analysis mm -hmm. that you presented? Yes, they, they, they follow it at least as far as the investigators calculate it. Yeah. But you know, they have to extrapolate. You, they only do the study for two years, sure. two and a half years. So they extra, if they extrapolate the, the curve, it, it follows, follows it precisely. Tony, I'm going to tap on your authorship of a cookbook uh, <laughs> as well as your science. There is some confusion now among the community with the newer nutrition guidelines that eggs may not be harmful to you or at least excess. And I've had some patients coming in and having at least a double, I mean, a dozen eggs per week. And, and the question to you is, uh, why those recommendations have changed was that they a push from the poultry industry, uh, which I heard there was, and, and w where's the science there? Well, <laughs> we actually had the, the, the egg industry supporting some lipoprotein research for a while. <laughs> because it raises, saturated fat raises HDL. And you get the same argument from the, uh, the coconut and palm oil industries. They've had a big uh, PR push in that it's healthy because it raises, raises HDL. But the difference with the egg is it has a lot of free cholesterol in it. Uh, and when Ansel Keys did his original studies, he showed that the, the strongest predictor both of change in cholesterol as well as increase in cardiovascular risk in the seven countries study was the proportion of saturated fat to uh, total calories in the diet. Now he also, and he had a formula for that. He also showed with some, some uh, CRC type diet control, control diet studies at Minnesota that cholesterol, dietary cholesterol would raise, had some effect on serum cholesterol uh, but not as much, it was a different formula. It was a square root function for cholesterol 
uh, where it was a straight line relationship with saturated fat. So uh, you can, if you raise your, if, if you, you want to eat an egg diet and see if it affects your cholesterol or LDL or HDL, you can do so. But uh, I think um, that the jury's still out on eggs. I wrote an editorial about 30 years ago uh, about a patient that was described in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, who was 80-something years old and he'd eaten 30 eggs a day for the last 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> all right, no more questions. Thank you very okay, much, right. uh, Tony, again. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you.